giving us their name and um, how they uh, identify themselves. So some people have been saying activist or academic or you know a number of things that they that they see themselves as shit disturber or whatever. Like, you know? <laughs> so some are very formal, some are very used that way, or whatever. But to say no, I'm so and so and and you know I'm an activist or I'm, you know whatever. So. Should I start then? Yeah, okay. and you look at me. Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Gerald Hannon. I will be 69 years old in July. I guess I would describe myself as a kind of semi-retired activist, since the activism now consists mostly of donating money to organizations I support and sitting on boards. That's not really how my activism began, though. I was very deeply involved in the uh, gay movement. 70s and 80s, um, but you know, after a certain point, you have to turn things over to another generation and do what you can in a different way. So that's kind of where I am today. Okay, good. Um, and tell us a bit about your work and how it addresses uh, queer liberation. And again, queer liberation, as I described before, queer being the politicized modern term we're using today, but linked with, again, the whole concept of liberation. Yeah. Well, my work, uh, as it relates to queer liberation, I guess, has been mostly my journalism. Although I was uh, also much active, in, active um, at the street level back in the beginning, but but since then, uh, and of course during the body politic years, I was the photographer there at the magazine and wrote a lot of stuff. But even since then, my journalism, although it's been largely devoted to bourgeois magazines, I try, when I can, to incorporate a kind of queer perspective. It doesn't work for a lot of the things that I write about, but it's the way I suppose I would say my queer liberation stuff continues, other than donating money to organizations that support and sitting on boards and dictating policy. So it's a uh, it was more exciting back in the day, for sure, when my queer activism meant being out on the street for demonstrations, uh, attending meetings, as boring as that may sound, but it wasn't because everything was changing and you got deeply involved in the work. Uh, writing stuff that was inflammatory just because it happened to, often just because it happened to be about being publicly gay, although there were other subjects that were even more inflammatory. So it was a real excitement then, and that excitement for me isn't around but uh, I guess I would define my work as a queer activist as mostly journalistic and in the past, at least, um, street level. Okay, great. just want to do a quick check. How are the glasses? Are they okay? They're okay. Yeah. All right, okay. good. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a problem when I need to photograph And without my glasses, I'm not me somehow. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, can you share with us experiences um, uh, as an activist that you've had that you think is significant for how we think about queer liberation as theory uh, or practice? Well, for me, the experiences that formed my notion of queer activism, I guess, were the basic ones at the time I was coming out, and that was coming out. Uh, I mean, it was not an easy thing to do back in, let's see, I'm trying to remember when I was seduced by Ed Jackson, <laughs> which was my first sexual experience, it was in 1968. And that was a time when uh, there wasn't, there didn't seem to be any other homosexuals around except a handful that we had, I, I met through Ed. And, there was no opportunity to be public, and it was very frustrating. There were very few bars, and they were not friendly. So the big thing for me was actually joining a gay liberation march in London, England. Actually, happened to be traveling within Europe at the time, and this would be probably in '69, I guess, uh, early '70s. And the agonizing, even in a foreign country, <laughs> about whether or not we should put our faces on the line it was <laughs> really, really difficult. I remember we stopped 
we were so anxious that we stopped in St. Paul's Cathedral to sort of <laughs> rebalance ourselves before joining the gay march that was happening at Snyder with the Gay Liberation Front there demonstrating against the Fleet Street, against the way gay issues were covered in the media at the time. And it was astonishing how quickly, once we left the church, joined the group and started marching, how right it seemed, <laughs> and how exhilarating it was to uh, shout out that gay is good. It felt as if, I don't know, decades of agony, agonizing had been lifted off our shoulders in the space of a few minutes. You know? And so that was the, 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 the crucial moment for me is emphasizing how important being out, something as simple as that, and yet so difficult uh, for a lot of people, even sometimes today, uh, was was for me, and that was, that was the crucial thing. Other things follow from it, the importance of organizing with other people, uh, the importance of keeping a public face, of you know, using the levers of power that were in place to get what you wanted, sometimes ignoring it, sometimes ignoring your roots. All of that followed from that one crucial, old-fashioned, <laughs> coming out moment. That's great. Um, and uh, now this might be to you based on the introduction you gave us, but how would you define your role in, in that movement that you were part of? Define your role in what? In that movement, in the gay liberation movement. Oh, were. how I define my role in the gay liberation movement? Well, I mean, it wasn't just one role. Uh, I mean, I was like uh, cannon fodder <laughs> some of the time, I suppose. I mean, just being willing to march in situations where not a lot of people were willing to march. Um, I seem to have the kind of jobs. No, I, that's, that's not true because I, I didn't have regular jobs by the time this all started. But I didn't care who knew, so I could be in anything. Um, I realized the need for photographs early on because uh, the paper, which is one of the earliest things I got, the body politic I mean, got involved, didn't have a regular photographer, so I took a photography course <laughs> and taught myself how to photograph a dark room together and a larger, and, and that became a critical contribution, so it turns out, to, uh, is that, can I keep going? Yes. Um, but that really was an important role, because we look back now on photographs that didn't seem all that important at the time, but now actually are a crucial part of our history. Uh, the other important role for me in the movement was as a writer who Essentially, I mean, I'm a good writer. I won a lot of national magazine awards, but I learned how to do it really by doing it endlessly at the body politic. I mean, I was a really stilted, constipated <laughs> writer uh, when I began. And it's possible to read some of my earlier stuff in the body politic and just get kind of a giggle out of it. It's so twisted, you know, tense and twisted. Um, but by doing you learn how to do if you've got some basic talent, which I had. So, um, producing a kind of journalism the newspaper could be proud of was an important role for me as well. And let's see if there are others I can think of. Um, I think that probably covers them. Again, that's all pretty much from the early part of my Okay, good. All right. Uh, the next question we've been asking people um, links to how I was describing this project. And the question itself is, how would you define queer liberation? Um, and again, as I was saying earlier, um, so that there isn't much confusion, you know, for, for us, we're, drawing, we're using the term queer in a very modern kind of way, politicized way. Mm -hmm. And yet, just, just putting those two words together is, is our attempt to kind of bridge this kind of um, link to uh, the very principles and tenets that people were operating from in that first wave of gay liberation. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you look at um, the world today and, and, and all that's happening either within our movement or even in mainstream society and, and their views of us as, as a movement or as a people, um, how would you define queer liberation from your perspective? Well, the fact of queer liberation is really, it's 
it's really difficult these days. I mean, it used to be so easy, I suppose, although were we, we were more thinking of gay rights back in the day when I started, and so many of those have been won that it's easy to see why the queer movement today might be a little bit listless, <laughs> hard to know what to grab onto next. And I'm not sure I can actually analyze where to go now. Things don't yet feel perfect, which I suppose is, is fine. Um, you, what do you need? You need, I mean, you know, the contrast I, I always tend to think of is that Well, people keep saying there are not a lot of people involved in queer activism today the way there used to be. But the thing is, that there never were very many involved in queer activism. Uh, it was a smallish handful of people who did stuff in the past, and it grew for sure over the years. But in reality, most people, and I've seen nothing wrong with this, want to lead comfortable, safe lives, have a job, have friends they can social, socialize with and be open most of the time about their private lives to the extent that society allows it. And gay liberation was, was, was seen to a lot of people like that as a real shit disturbing movement that was just going to upset the apple cart and make things difficult for everybody. And where am I going with this? <laughs> um, but it was necessary. And the fact that a few lives might become suddenly uncomfortable for a while. I mean, society has a way of making people. Well, I'm beginning to babble. Let's stop for a second. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Collect your thoughts. Yeah. Um, I suppose the question is why we feel we need to take queer liberation further than it's come. I mean, the. The advent of the trans movements added a new layer of activism, possible activism that wasn't really there in the past. Um, there were trans people, of course, but they didn't seem to have much of an impact early on, not with the mainstream gay movement anyway. Um, you know, we now have, unfortunately, gay marriage. We have sports people coming out, I and mean, it seems everything seems kind of hunky dory. Queer activism should work, could work on issues that were that are really difficult to persuade people of, I suppose. Like the need to get to end marriage for everyone rather than grant it to gays uh, was a position actually that the Law Commission took here in Canada back in the day and no one paid any attention to it. Yet. It was but I don't know how you begin to organize around. I really have no idea how you do it. The questions of the, what, of child pornography and censorship are issues that I could see queer liberation getting involved with, or perhaps should get involved with, but again, it would be a very difficult one to get people to organize around. I and mean, we all know what the government means by kitty porn. It's not what we mean. <laughs> and there's a, there, there's a good reason to have it. Allows young people to make their own stuff, but uh, but actually, I guess I don't really answer. I don't know how to. Those are the issues that concern me for a queer movement, but they seem like suicide pills in some fashion. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Okay, that's good. Um, and with this next question, you kind of touched on as well in, in uh, your introduction and. and what role you played in the movement. But the question is, how is queer liberation expressed in your activism slash art slash theory? So if I just kind of draw on what you talked about a little earlier, your role as a photographer, your role as a writer, um, if, you know, if you want to go more in depth as to the value of those roles, as well as anything else for that matter, you're, you're welcome to in terms of what photography or what pictures mean, what those photos mean to us today and what those writings mean when people go back and look at what was written uh, at a time when it wasn't so safe to talk about some of those things. Well, in my role as 
photographer for the body politic and writer there as well. I, I mean, the contribution seems is essentially creating our history. And that is something that's not easy to do. You don't want it to be just an oral transmission. You want to be able to look back and say, yeah, we did that. We did that on that day and had this effect. And it's very difficult to do that if you, do, if you only have people's memories to go on. Uh, I know that <laughs> vividly because my memory is often. Uh, I see things in the paper I don't remember happened, and I remember things that uh, happened at a different time or a different place that appeared there in the paper. But you know, I, I and others were there recording at the time. So if you want a history, you kind of need to do that sort of stuff. And that's, I think, the, the contribution I, I feel I made. I wasn't the only one. There were a lot of writers in the body politic. I was pretty much the principal photographer, though. Um, but it's interesting when young people look at early issues of the body politics. Sometimes people come by, I have a box of them <laughs> in my apartment. And uh, they're, they're kind of enraptured. And not just by the stories and photographs, but even things like the, the ads you know, in the paper. There was, I mean, there was a bar at this address in Down the Street. I mean, there were, <laughs> there were bars. <laughs> uh, it's hard for a lot of people looking at it back at a time before they were born. And it's like, uh, the comparison I like to make is I had a friend who's now deceased, but he was 20 some years older than I, and uh, he liked talking about the Second World War, he was involved in the war. And, uh, and it, it, you know, to some degree it might be a little boring to me because it happened, well, I was born in 44, but I don't remember the war. Uh, but it was a really significant moment for him. He was a gay man as well, and being able to talk about what it was like being gay, not being out, uh, you know, in France, you know, France, yeah, uh, at a time when uh, the Nazi invasion was happening, it was really, so it's, it's that kind of look back at a time that barely exists for you because you weren't there, and for a lot of young people, the work that I understood the paper produces that same kind of effect, I think. So that's, that's I think, probably the most significant stuff I've done as a queer actor. Right. Um, why don't we move into um, uh, some of that early work then, you know, and, and of course that significant piece that, that uh, happened at the Body Politic when you um, authored the piece on uh, Men Loving Boys Love the Men. And uh, maybe to begin, if I just ask you about um, um, your writing of that. And uh, um, what what you know was that something that you uh, say pitched to the body politic that that either I wanted to write this or you had a draft of it and you wanted to bring it forward? Was this discussed in advance with others? I'm just curious around how that that came together for you. Men Loving Boys of the Man is probably the most significant thing in terms of public reaction that I put or published, I got published in the body politic and that I wrote. Um, the interesting thing to remember about it though is that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't just itself, it was part of a series. We conceived a series of articles that would deal with youth sexuality because we thought that was an important direction to go in, that uh, the earlier young people found out about gay and if they were could come out it was an important way of growing the movement. And building community was a crucial goal for the public politics. So there was an, an article, I think I don't have to remember them all, but there was one on uh, gays in high school where I interviewed some two young men, I think, yeah, two a couple of young guys in high school and the the agonies of that because they were a bit out. There was another one, I think, on the issue of consent. And there may have been another one, but this, this was the difficult one, because we knew it was the one that would provoke most response, but we also thought, at least I was particularly, I thought it was important to talk about the kinds of relationships young people might get into without judgment, because most young people, I think, probably want to have relationships with other young people. But not all do. I've met many <laughs> who like older guys. And um, 
So we decided to, I decided to write it, research it, interview, and then we decided to publish it. Now we originally meant to publish it in this, one of those early issues of 77, I guess. But that was the summer that Emmanuel Jacobs, the um, shoeshine boy, Portuguese shoeshine boy, was abducted and murdered on Young Street in a body rock parlor, and that created a real outrage. Rightly so, and uh, uh, at least one of the killers was gay, and the male one that I'm not sure. And so we thought this was not the time to publish. So we waited till the end of the year, and thinking that was okay. But I don't think we actually realized what an open wound that murder was in the psyche of Toronto, Torontonians, because it we probably would have had to wait several years, I think, if we actually thought it would have no effect. But we did. We published in November, December 71, I think. And Claire Hoy, who was a columnist of the Toronto Sun, was outraged by it. We began publishing articles about how horrible it was and interest of the police, I think. Some other police got a copy. Anyway, it resulted in a police raid on the motor politics. Uh, as for my interest in the, uh, I mean, I, I've always had an interest in, I guess what may be called sort of like extreme ends of the sexual spectrum. <laughs> uh, it was, and I, I knew also a couple of uh, men who were primarily, primarily interested in boys or, or, or early teens. And they didn't strike me as monsters. I mean, they seemed responsible. They seem to deal well with the young person's developing sexuality. Um, there are, of course, power differences, and, but there are in every relationship. It's, so I, I wasn't 100% convinced these relationships were morally neutral, but I was leaning in that direction. I probably overwrote the piece in that direction because I think one of my goals was to try and normalize these relationships. And, and I'm still, I still regret <laughs> the last sentence in the piece where I talk about how these relationships deserve our admiration and respect or honor and respect. I can't remember the phrase, but it's, I don't think it's true of any relationship, just by virtue of the kind of relationship it is. So I was really going a bit overboard there, but I was, I was intent on trying to say this is not the Frankenstein nastiness that you might think it is. So, like, read about these lives and put up here on paper and come to your own conclusions, except I try to push the conclusion a little bit <laughs> in that direction. So, I don't know, do you want me to go more into the reaction? Yeah, I was going to go to the next, so I just wanted to get a bit of a piece of, of how this um, you know, developed and, and made its way to France, which you want to just describe, which is great. Um, and then, of course, we know historically this. this caused quite a stir, a big stir um, in, in Toronto and for the body politic. If you want to go into that, like how, how it came out and how did the world take this? <laughs> <laughs> well, the world took <laughs> men loving boys, loving men, not to heart, let's say. It, uh, it provoked a police raid on the body politic, which uh, on the, I think, December 30th. So just as the year was closing, and it happened, I wasn't in the office at the time, but my friend Ed Jackson was, and a number of other people, they came in and the search warrant and began packing stuff up. And I can't remember how many cars they had, quite a few. My Ed has this wonderful memory of, uh, because the, the office was on the fifth floor walk up, because he was afraid of the uh, to Duncan Street, Natalie Street, downtown now, the entertainment district. <laughs> Wasn't then at the time, it was very cheap. Um, and he has this memory of them having loaded all of these boxes onto the freight elevator and then seeing the, you know, the whole thing slowly sinking down as it disappeared out of our hands. I mean, they took subscription lists, they took financial records, they took um, everything they could take to close us down. Luckily, we had a hidden copy of the subscription list that they didn't know about, which we were able to use to begin well, 
fill subscriptions, but also as a way of um, uh, starting a body called Free the Press Fund, which we did because we knew we would need a lot of money to fight this case and we intended to fight it. We were charged with uh, early in January the use of the mails to transmit, what was it, immoral, indecent, or scurrilous matter. People think we were charged with obscenity, but we weren't. And it was so clear that it could never be found to be obscene that they had to haul up this obscure law that had only been used, I think, once before in Canadian jurisprudence. <laughs> immoral, indecent, or scurrilous. I'm kind of proud of that. <laughs> kind of sums my life up, really. I should have been guilty. Um, and then we were taken in, I was charged, Ken Coker was charged, and Ed Jackson was charged, and I wasn't charged because there was the writer I was charged because we, for legal reasons, had formed a, a corporation in, in Triangle Press, and we were the officers, so we were charged as officers of the press and therefore responsible for the use of the nails for immoral and decent and scurrilous matter. And then we were fingerprinted and photographed and waited around for a year for a trial. Um, the Crown offered us deals over that year, various promises of light penalty slaps on the hands, whatever, if we would only be guilty. Uh, but we always turned them down. Uh, and we debated it. Uh, our lawyer often thought we should accept because lawyers always want the minimum amount of trouble uh, and a guaranteed solution. There's no guarantee coming out of the trial. Uh, but we always decided that uh, pleading guilty to being immoral, no matter or indecent, just wasn't the cards for us. I mean, we would, whatever penalties there were, if we were found guilty, we would take. It came to a real climax just before the trial began. February of 79. No, it was in January of 79. Because John Sewell had just been elected mayor, and we contacted him to see if he could give support. We were planning a rally just before the trial began. And uh, to our surprise, he agreed. I mean, we knew he was elected councillor, but he, here he was mayor, and that really, his doing that really set the cat among the pigeons, so to speak. I mean, uh, his office was deluged with hate calls. He was uh, Mayor Sui, which is what he was called by the Toronto Sun. And, uh, but it was really morale building for us, as was the rally he spoke in. It was a lot. This is where the connections between the arts community on Long Queen West at the time and the gay movement really, I mean, we were all friends. We were all living in the same area. Uh, general idea was down there. The cliches were down there, I and mean, it was that everyone knew everyone else and worked together. They uh, they were as opposed to censorship as we were. I mean, they could see it coming down the arts mentioned too. So they produced really quite an amazing show. Um, I can remember the cliches singing "You Don't Own Me" <laughs> and coming down the stage <laughs> at the end as they're all stretched out. Uh, and Randy and Gertie Chay did something. It would be good to have a full list of all the people who appeared there and then Sewell's book. And that brought the house down. And then the trial began. Am I going into too much detail? No, 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 it's okay. No, it's okay. Yeah, yeah sure. sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and the trial went on for a week or so. It was heavily covered in the media. And uh, we had a stellar list of witnesses on our side. They, uh, I thought the crowd had a rather trashy list of witnesses. They were from Ken Campbell to Claire Hoyt. Um, and these are names that probably don't mean much anymore to most people, but I'll let you fill that in. <laughs> and then we had Judge Harris, who's the benign figure out in front of the room. It, it was kind of excruciating because you went to the back of Most excruciating was the day he gave his judgment, which was February 14th, Valentine's Day in uh, 79 because Ed and I and Ken went to the prisoner's dock and he said, uh, you probably want to sit down, it's going to take a while, the judge said, <laughs> and began reading his judgment, which went on, I think, for 19 minutes. And in the process, you thought, 
That's it. I said, oh, my God, he's going to find guilty. He's guilty. And then five months later, oh, I think we're heading to an acquittal. <laughs> and then 15 months later, oh, I'm almost guilty. I can tell, I can tell. Uh, until finally, with all the stuff balanced out at the end, he said, and I hereby find the defendants not guilty. And uh, the courtroom erupted into applause, which was great. And then uh, the, the press covered it. <laughs> Uh, reasonably well, I think, except for that the star had a kind of twist on it. But it doesn't matter. We were acquitted. We weren't finally acquitted as it turned out the Crown appealed. Uh, there was a, 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 we lost that appeal. A second trial was ordered. We were tried all over again on the same charge. Acquitted the second time. The Crown appealed that, a seeking <laughs> a third trial. Um, but I think at, by that point, public reaction was kind of sickened by what looked like real harassment, legal harassment. I mean, it was clear they weren't going to rest until they got a guilty verdict. And we, we arranged, the Free the Press Fund arranged for a full page jam of all the mail signed by people and just dropped the appeal. And they finally didn't let it lapse, so they would have had to act before a certain date, and they didn't do so it lapsed. And so the acquittal, both acquittals, finally stood. And they were so after us, because when, just before the trial, the first trial, they raided our office again for an article that had appeared in the paper called Lust of the Proper Stranger. I think I didn't write it, it was written by Anonymous, although we knew who it was, and it was on the etiquette of fist, fist bucking. And that was charged with obscenity. And we, we were tried for that and acquitted there. I mean, we were, but the, it was so clearly an attempt to black out our reputation, but just before the trial started on Melody Boys and the Men, were raided again on something else that they imagined would gross most people out. I mean, it really was painting us into a corner of being like the grossest paper in Canada. Uh, with like articles on this fucking article, fucking kids, and you know, what are these people trying to do? But you know, none of it worked. <laughs> and in a way, going back to your activism question, I, and I think. We, we could have been much more supine, I think, during that, and let our lawyer handle everything, which is, but it was important to us to use this to build community and do it by contacting not just our membership list, but that was important, because, and, and to sell the idea that censorship was bad, even though you might not agree with what was written in the paper, you don't want to stifle free exchange of opinion. So the activism included lots of propaganda in a way, you know, reaching out to our, our membership, our readership, but also reaching out to other communities, reaching out to the arts world, which was crucial for that fundraising thing, uh, reaching out to um, uh, unions, you know, and general lefty sorts of people. Uh, reaching out to women's groups as we did. So, it, I mean, activism then, at least to a large degree, was reaching out and building. I mean, it's, it's probably <laughs> not a revelation, it's, it's what every successful movement has ever done, I think. You can't do it on your own. And, uh, and certainly, we didn't win all those acquittals on our own. Uh, I mean, I think we were lucky in the judge, but that's like a kind of minor historical detail on that. Um, what was more important was that, had we been convicted, the outrage, I think, among people that mattered would have been high. The arts world would have been outraged, the uh, civil libertarians would have been outraged, and would have, yeah, because they had helped build our acquittal, right? So, that's, <laughs> that's activism for you. <laughs> wow, it's, it's quite an interesting story. Um, it's a long one too. I hope I didn't go on too long. Oh no, 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 that's good. It's good to have that kind of detail. Um, and you know, it's even even as you were saying, I think you, you used the term earlier that for some reason that these issues become poison pills, you know, or, or you know, kind of a, a route to suicide for mm -hmm. movements or groups or what have you. Um, I'm finding that when the issue and it's always delicately raised around um, youth sexuality, um, and even if it goes to the extent of uh, 
children engaging in, in, in sex with someone older, not just exploring amongst themselves, which is you know, normal behavior and stuff, but um, terminology is used today such as intergenerational sex. And, and even then, when that arises, it's, it's delicately handled and sensitive, and you have to watch where you say it and who's in you know, the room and, and stuff. So I was just wondering, you know, from um, again, if uh, that liberation perspective, and as you were mentioning, you became aware of some people that had these experiences. Um, if you wanted to speak to that um, at all, to, to, to the piece around um, that for some people it's part of their reality, it's part of their sexual experience that they had intergenerational sex. Right. And how does that link to liberation? Well, how does intergenerational sex relate to liberation? It make, makes no intellectual sense to me that some, some kind of sex, that, that certain kinds of sexual connect, connection are always wrong, always harmful, always evil. This doesn't make any sense. There's too much evidence to the contrary, although mostly that evidence gets suppressed. People who have positive feelings on those issues through involvement on their own is, you know, are often really reluctant to talk about them because it makes them seem sicko or it makes people say you were exploited even though they may not have felt exploited. So from a liberationist perspective, I guess you should be looking for those voices, uh, voices that can help turn the tide. I mean, they're hard to find, but they are out there. I, I, you know, be up to a movement to discover how to find them and how to um, broadcast them without seeming too prurient, I, I suppose. But uh, it's a challenge, <laughs> my Terry opinion. But finding voices, I mean, finding voices for the gay movement was important at the beginning. Voices who would say, I'm gay. I'm not ashamed of it, and I'm going to say it whenever it has to be said. Uh, finding voices who could say, you know, I was having sex with uh, older people when I was seven, and I'm completely happy, healthy, hetero, or homo, or trans, or whatever. Uh, those would be valuable voices to find, but boy, <laughs> a challenge finding them. And so if I could make a bit of a leap now, because I want to make sure this gets to be part of the interview. Um, I, you know, I was just talking a bit about you know, one kind of sex and liberation. Um, uh, you know, some people by choice, you're, you're one of them, made um, decisions in their life to engage in sex work. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of sex, it's kind of linked with, with um, providing a service for people and making money in the process. Uh, if I can put it that way. <laughs> um, and yet, you know, um, if you could maybe talk a little bit about that experience and if you see that as a link to liberation. Um, maybe you do, maybe you don't, I don't know. But Well, sex work as liberation is, uh, I mean, any decision to use your body the way you want to use it, as long as it's not, you know, harming someone else is liberating, I feel. So, Yeah, the decision to, actually, my decision to do sex work wasn't done because I wanted to <laughs> advance queer liberation through uh, sex work. It was done because I was going broke and <laughs> I needed the money. I began in 1980, I, I stayed with the body politic until its last issue in 1987. Um, and then I decided I was, what, 40? Three, uh, four of my sevens, two. <laughs> And not getting any younger, and had no real. Well, I mean, I had a lot of skills, but I mean, uh, 15 years of the body politics is not like the best CV to go to the world with. Um, and I wanted to be a freelance writer, but that takes a while to get going. You just don't suddenly start making money as a freelance writer. So I was afraid I would be broke, and a friend of mine who had worked as a sex worker, recommended it, and then another friend, you might do remember Danny Cockerline, 
Um, that was his real name, and Koch was his line, actually, <laughs> for a good part of his life. Um, but he was cute, pretty cute, and young, and well hung, and probably full of cum. <laughs> Uh, and I didn't believe I could do it, actually, because I was, you know, in my 40s, and I didn't think I would be crying the material. But anyway, they said there's a market for everything. Anybody can be a sex worker, pretty much. I was still nervous, so I decided I would, another friend of mine who was uh, also going broke, we decided we would do it together and advertise as a team. And then they make it cheaper to have both of us than to have one of us in a bit. And uh, we were astonished at how easy it was. I mean, we were terrified when the first client turned up, but it turns out that they were most often the clients. Here they don't know whether they're walking into a trap, they don't know whether I'm going to steal their wallet or slit their throats and drop them in the back, you know, outside the building. Um, so it, 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 was, it really made my life. It was such an easy way to make money. I could write until a phone call came in, uh, take a half an hour off make 50 bucks and then go back to writing again. And it also gives you a lot of dinner anecdotes, which uh, <laughs> people value. And it also gave me an insight into men's lusts, an incredible variety of things that people want to do and are often ashamed of doing. Uh, and in a way, I could almost be like a liberationist or <laughs> I could always make people feel comfortable about what they wanted to do. I never had a sense, I never conveyed a sense that this was gross. I always cherished the same rate for whatever anyone wanted because it seemed to me if I charged more for something that was generally thought to be uh, disgusting or low on the level of acceptance, verify that moral judgment and say, okay, you want me to poo on your chest? Same price as if we were going to kiss, you know. <laughs> it, uh, and I think, I mean, that's a pretty modest form of liberationist activity, I think. But still, it was a way I was conscious of it. I, I didn't just say $50 for everything. I said $50 for everything because I'm not judging what you want. So, is, is this leading up to the Ryerson thing? Or, yeah, yeah, and that's where I was going to go next, uh, in the sense of um, it's one thing to do that, and, um, and a lot of sex workers may, may be public about it, may not be that public about it, but when this, um, maybe you want to share a bit about how this became public for you, and um, ultimately your choice not to deny it either, and just stand by this as a part of what you did for the well, everything, <laughs> the, years, the year 1995 <laughs> was like one of the worst years of my life in a way. Uh, I was uh, teaching magazine writing at uh, Ryerson University. And the job I was doing well, the students liked me, and was well reviewed by uh, personal evaluation of my staff and by the students. Uh, that gave me some extra money. I was still working as a sex worker, though, on the side. A few of my colleagues who were also friends of Ryerson knew it, but it wasn't generally known. And then an incredible number of coincidences happened. Uh, the, there was a, a woman called Judy Steed who had written, this is a longer story, I do you want to all the details? <laughs> do a quick check. We're okay. We are okay. Yeah, 20 minutes, 20 to 12. Okay. I'll try to shorten it. Sure. There was a, uh, a meeting here in Toronto of uh, women in the media. It was uh, brought together women to talk about their role in the media. Judy Steed was on a panel. Uh, Judy Steed had written a book called Our Little Secret, which deplored the exploitation of children, sexual exploitation of children. She interviewed me briefly, but she was outraged by stuff I had to say, so she, she essentially hated me, I think. Uh, she had uh, students at Ryerson had been doing a piece on sexual exploitation of children. They interviewed her. She was a go-to person to speak to. They mentioned in passing, hey, you know Gerald Hannon, he works here at Ryerson. She was horrified uh, and called up, uh, I can't remember his name, but the chair of my department and said, do you have Gerald Hannon working there? 
And he said, yes, he teaches magazine journalism here. Well, the next day, or two days later, was this media conference, and she took the stand to denounce Ryerson for hiring me. He was in the audience, stood up and defended me. But Heather Bird, a columnist of the Sun, was also in the audience, who thought, hey, there could be a story here. Um, I happened to be in New York and knew nothing of this was happening. I came back with a phone message from Heather Bird saying, I asked her for an interview, and I gave her an interview. I, the question seemed to be at all, but I didn't know of this whole media event. And the next day, she had a column called The Professor of Desire. She linked me back to body politic and the loving boys of the man. And she accused me of promulgating those views in the classroom, which I had never done. Um, at the same time, and this is where all the weird coincidences happen, I'd been involved in a film by Nick Sheen called The Symposium, um, which he was trying to recreate Plato's Symposium using modern day homos at a dinner party talking about various aspects of love. I spoke about my sex work and was filmed uh, naked in bed with a young man and then eventually sucking his cock. Now, Nick was promoting this at the same time, and still from that film, I ended up on a desk, entertainment desk at the Toronto Sun. And <laughs> they began putting two and two together, and a, a, a reporter called me up and asked about the film Love. And he said, I thought that film involved people's real life experiences. Are you a sex worker? And I really didn't agonize the core answering that question because I thought, you know, the, the previous two weeks had been hell because the blow up over my teaching at Ryerson and the repeated columns by Heather Bird. And I thought I can only get worse. And part of my, I finally decided I would just tell the truth. Partly because I'm not a good liar. <laughs> uh, partly because I thought it was a defensible act. And partly because, and this is the less applaudable reason, I thought they wouldn't ask that question if they didn't have some solid evidence that I was, and for me to deny it would just make me sort of a liar, and who wants to be caught up to the lie? So I said yes, shake up the fan the next day, the three inch <laughs> headline on the front page of the Toronto Sun was Ryerson Croft, I'm a hooker, and then my life fell apart, actually. It, um, I had death threats. I, had, I tried to teach a class after death threats at the university at Ryerson. I had to be escorted to the class by security guards. They had to close the, window, the curtains on the windows for fear of a sniper on the adjoining building. The students were letting one by one. Then the security guards locked the door when it was time for me to teach. And then I was expected to teach a class. I mean, I really kind of almost fell apart during that period. I had a lot of support from friends and support from other students, from students and teachers at Rye. But the psychological cost was very high. And, uh, but I made it through. Mm -hmm. And I didn't betray my principles. <laughs> Great, okay. Well, I didn't know that whole lot louder part, of course, because that's that was away from the cameras when all that happened. Uh, you know, what you just described, you know, what, how one is personally affected by that kind of, you know. Yeah, we never want to go through it again. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was, uh, yeah, the support was sweet. There was a, there was a press conference at Buddies and Bad Times, which was really amazing. And it, it, it became important to me to not look worn down, to keep a sense of humor. Uh, to treat lightly this thing that everyone else thought was really grave. And I just remember um, a statement I made at the press conference. Uh, it was an opening statement or an answer to the question, but I, I said, you know, I give good prose, I give, give good classroom, I give good head. For a university ostensibly concerned with excellence, I don't see what the problem is. <laughs> and that, you know, that broke the room up. And, Earned me the respect of, uh, of uh, Christy Blatchford and other people. I mean, the sun was pretty unanimously hostile, except she wrote a very supportive column in the wake of that. 
So not that I like a lot of what she writes, but still, <laughs> having Christy on my side was a little surprising. But, uh, yeah. It's 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 something, and I don't know if it's me making the link, but I think it's it's something when people take those major personal risks um, in society because it sends it sends a message people normally hear, right? Um, I actually remember that press conference. Um, oh, you did? Yeah, I didn't go to it. I saw it on the news, you know. <laughs> and uh, and as you described, is what amazed me about it is, is that you you did come across as fairly non plus you know. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and you kind of threw it back at society, like what almost as if what's your issue? Mm -hmm. You know, that's how it kind of came across to me. Not that this is a real challenge to everyone's thinking about sex work. You know. <laughs> yes, it was good. It was bad for you, but it was good for that discussion. Although it never went as far as I wanted it to go, they, they were too, the media were too thrilled by the, I think the oddity of that some of my age, education, ability to speak well, was doing this. I mean, they, they didn't begin to question whether or not that they should be questioning the occupation, right? It was still, it was too much of a, uh, a freak show in a way. One thing I should mention though, which relates to the importance of connections, is that because I was so much of a mess and had a wide circle politically and in terms of friends, those you know connections were called in. I mean, they they did things like make that press conference happen, and uh, they did things like start the uh, oh there was a uh, I'm not thinking of the body politic free the press one, but there was a drill hand defense league or something I can't remember, which drew in people. Uh, Again, some of the artists from the from Queen West people that I knew back in the day around the body politic trial were the same people who came in and did their kind of laid work that kept my cause moving. It wouldn't have been something I could have done on my own, and it showed the importance to me of political connections and political organizing and maintaining and building friendships. And, you know, all of that was really important through that period. So. You learn the same lessons over and over and over again in politics, it seems. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, they're, yeah, they're worth hearing. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, let me do a quick time check. It's um, 10 to 12. We have another one at, at noon, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe, uh, Martin can read a bit if necessary. Right. Okay. So, um, I mean, I'm just thinking here, we, we covered off two major issues that I wanted to know. So I have a question, Joe. Oh, sure. After all the smoke settled and things sort of got a little bit more normal for you, did it change the way you felt about anything with sex or with how you, you know, approached your life in any way? You can, you can, you can look, look at me, okay. yeah, and then you can answer. Yeah. Okay, how it change, whether it changed my... Well, whether it changed your, your, you know, your attitude towards how you had sex, what you uh, did, um, your whole um, lifestyle, I guess. Did it alter that at all? Yeah, the, the experience of Ryerson, it didn't actually change my view of sex. It was astonishing how few of my clients, well, I lost clients, I guess, who were not going to turn up at a place that was being stalked by the media, I suppose. But, uh, no, I think they had a pretty solid, unromanticized view of sexual connections between people, and this didn't, this didn't change that. Uh, I continued sex work after, until, until my retirement party in <laughs> Bone Mary last year. And uh, it remained an important part of my life. I, uh, I guess if, if anything changed, I mean, practical things changed. I lost my job at the uh, did not renew my contract. And I, I feel they're, they should be ashamed of that. <laughs> um, but in a way, it forced me to be more to write more because I had to make up the uh, income that I lost 
It's easy to blunder ahead. It's easy to be bureaucratized and just keep the office going. <laughs> but the hard part is knowing what the office is there for and remembering what the office is there for and continuing to talk about maybe even like closing the office if you have to, but continuing to talk about what you're really trying to do. It's just to keep the office open. You seem to be right there, but yeah, those are the ones that stick in my mind for sure. And, and um, while I have you mentioned briefly, um, uh, very briefly, uh, your disdain around same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. um, and that's you know uh, kind of a major example of the direction you went in <laughs> mm -hmm. in the last number of years. Mm -hmm. you know, did did you want to maybe say a bit about that? Uh, contextualize that as well um, in terms of talking about same-sex marriage and what you think about Same-sex marriage, I don't approve of, although I was actually critiqued by my friend Jerry Oxford who lives in New York and is twice the idea of marrying his partner. It's much more crucial down there in his view because of the crazy network. It's all individual by individual states and if you don't, you, you could be married in one state and still have trouble getting it doing all sorts of basic bureaucratic things in another state that won't be across the border and changes just to make that easy for people to just like remove that whole thing. He's coming to view that it's important in the states. I don't think it was ever important here. It, uh, it struck me, it still strikes me as odd to privilege people in a variety of ways simply because they found a partner. Uh, I mean, but I like the law commissions advice, which was let people decide for themselves the relationships they want, given benefits by the government. It shouldn't automatically fall, just often would, just because people need certain elements, you know, from the, from the state for an actual marriage and family. But, you know, the example keeps me thinking of I need help from the government because I'm caring for my old aunt, why can't I get the privileges that would come if we were married? Uh, and we're not going to marry, but I decided that I need, I need certain help with this and uh, I shouldn't have to get it just through social assistance or whatever it is. It's the, that people decide for themselves, it's a classic thing, that people decide for themselves. And, uh, but it seems, it seems to have lost cause now. And the problem with, with marriage is it's so indelibly mixed up with romance, and who's against romance, I suppose. Um, to seem against being married, to seem against hearts and flowers and romance and pink and angels. And <laughs> it's crushed them all under my heel, that's what I said. <laughs> you know, I can be a romantic too. I mean, I've had affairs and so on. I would never have wanted in long-term relationships. I would never have wanted to marry. And I don't think it's only because my Parents have terrible marriage. <laughs> I know there are good ones out there for sure, but we seen something built into built into it. Anyway, I've talked about something. Okay, that's great. Okay, <laughs> that was very good. I really appreciate that, Gerald. Yeah, taking the time to be with us. Oh, Mark, okay. I've got one more question. For oh, you. okay, no, sure. Uh, how do you see queer liberation today compared to the gay movement that you were very much a part of uh, 30, 40 years ago? Well, seeing gay or queer liberation today compared to when I was involved, I mean, it's, I mean, it's still a cowardly answer in a way, but I've, I'm kind of out of it. I mean, I don't see enough of what's going on. I'm not, as I said, I give money and I sit on a board, which doesn't give me much insight into what people like you guys are doing in queer Ontario, so I'm not even quite sure what's up. <laughs> um, I know it's really challenging for you uh, because the, the, the world is not as easy to be an activist in as it was back in the day. I mean, you're doing, you can cause a scene back then by walking hand in hand. I mean, we, we, had, we held kiss hands at the corner of Young and Bluer because two men were arrested for kissing on the street. You can practically do anything you want on the street these days, and you're not going to get in trouble. So in a way, it was easy to be an activist then, easy to, 
easier for sure than it is today. Now you've got to really think the direction you want stuff to go and plan to organize. I don't know, does that answer the question? <laughs> sure. Yeah, yes. I think we just wanted a viewpoint. So uh, okay. okay. Thank you so much.